Thank you. <laughs> wow, I do get a woo. That coffee must be really good. Um, so, yeah, speaking of coffee, I just thought this was a funny slide to have after the break. This is me after three coffees, so um, I eat right now. Um, so, uh, you notice that this, the, the title of my talk in no way matches the slide that um, was just on before, because I'm always changing titles of things, so I just thought this was... I don't know, I thought it was funny. Um, thanks for that introduction, Tim. That was so nice. I love working with Tim, so I just feel so lucky anytime I get a chance to cross paths and, uh, and collaborate with him on anything. Um, so yeah, this is me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter um, if you want to reach out and ask any other questions um, after this talk or any time in the future. I am um, the Chief Experience Officer at Speedcurve. Um, what does that mean? I don't know. It means, oh, a Speedcurve woo, that's awesome. Um, so we're a, a web performance monitoring company, so we do synthetic and real user monitoring. Um, and as Tim mentioned, um, I help curate uh, WPO stats, but like shout out to Tim for WPO stats, because he's actually the person who built it and kind of just invited me to come along and, and help curate. Um, if you're interested, it's a really great repository of case studies um, submitted by companies, so actual like people who, who did the work, um, where one of the kind of criteria for submitting something to WPO stats and having it appear there is that there must be a demonstrable connection between what you did performance-wise and some kind of business or user experience impact. So it's just a really, really great resource. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I work at SpeedCurve. Uh, the, by far, the best, most fun part of my job is that I get to speak to a lot of different companies about performance and how they do performance and kind of what their their concerns are and their issues and the really creative solutions that they've come up with to um, to push performance in their company and to actually make make things better, make things faster for their users. Um, so these are these are some of the, the, the people that I, I talk with. Um, I try to talk to companies at least once or twice a year. So as you can imagine, that's a lot of conversations. And I've been at Speaker for over two and a half years now. So I reckon that's probably something like. Um, two or three hundred conversations that I've had with uh, with different groups of people. So there's way more than I can fit into a 45 minute talk, but I'm going to do my best. And some of the things that I'm going to talk about as well aren't going to be just specific to um, people that I've talked to it with, but actually other case studies and people that I've kind of I've read really inspiring things by online or listened to in various podcasts. Um, so kind of going way back, I want to see how well this. Okay, this is good. It's clear. Um, Kind of going way back, so Lara Hogan, she doesn't really kind of do performance anymore, and our community lost like a bright shining star when she became a, a, a management consultant. But um, former um, uh, engineering lead at Etsy, VP of engineering at Kickstarter, um, really drove performance in both of those organizations. And she wrote a really great book called Designing for Performance that she's kindly released most, most or all of the text to online, and you can find it if you go to that link. And this quote really jumped out me. She did a whole chapter on performance culture, and I think, to my reckoning, kind of in like early days is one of the first people to kind of come up with this term, performance culture. And I think a lot of us really kind of gravitated towards that because she articulated so many things that we realized kind of were, were, were challenges that were not technical challenges to driving performance. And as she says here, I'll kind of read it for the benefit of anybody who, who can't see this. Uh, the largest hurdle to creating and maintaining stellar site performance is the culture of your organization. And so um, I, I imagine that that's probably going to resonate for a lot of you in this room. And she further said, no matter the size or type of team, it can be a challenge to educate, incentivize, and empower those around you. And so performance more often comes down to a cultural challenge rather than simply a technical one. I see cameras up. I'll stop for a second. Don't you hate it? You like go to take a picture, and then it's like, oh, next slide. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was mean. Um. <laughs> Um, so these are the three words that kind of like uh, are sort of the cornerstones of, of the talk that I, that I want to give today. So the three words that, that Lara mentioned, um, educate, incentivize, and empower people. So how do you actually do that within an organization? How do you do it? Maybe it's easier in some ways with a smaller org, but more challenging in other ways, like every size of org has different, different issues. Um, 
uh, or maybe you kind of work in a larger company where you, you know, you're trying to actually get people thinking about performance throughout a company that has like thousands of employees. How do you, how do, you do that? I'm not going to give you all the answers here because I don't have all the answers, but I'm going to tell you what I know and kind of hopefully point you towards some other resources that will help you learn a little bit more. And it's just kind of an ongoing learning process. And one of the things I love about um, conferences like this is just how so many different people from so many different companies kind of come to the table and there's so much sharing and cross-pollination of information. So um, I definitely, you know, if you have great tips on your own, share them in the Twitter hashtag or DM me or tweet at me, whatever. I, I really love learning what people are actually doing out in the real world. So basically, kind of, this is just this little cycle. I, I made this cheesy graphic. It's like the most corporate looking graphic I think I've ever made. But it's basically what you want to do is you get people to care about performance in general. You get people to actually realize that performance matters in, in kind of the larger sense. And then get people to care about the performance of your site, your, your web property in particular, and then involve them in making things better, celebrate the wins, and then that kind of continues the cycle of getting more people to care. So before we get into things, I kind of want to jump in the Wayback Machine. I'm dating myself. Who, who actually knows what this is refer in reference to? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so all the old people. Okay. Sorry. Myself included. Myself included. Um, so the Wayback Machine is a, TV, a cartoon called Mr. Peabody and, Her and Sherman. It's kind of a funny show. Anyway, so we're going to jump back in time to... 2009, um, which is kind of when I started to get really interested in performance, um, coming kind of from a user experience background. And um, there was a really great case study that a company called Shopzilla, which is now um, known as Connexity. And they did a great uh, presentation at Velocity where they shared that they improved load time. They kind of shaved it all the way down to 1.2 seconds. It was awesome for their business. They increased conversions by like up to 12% um, and 25% increase in traffic, although that's a little bit hard to quantify, you know, that it came from performance. It might have been other things. But the conversion thing, I, I, I can kind of buy that. But then what I thought was really interesting was that a year later, they came back to Velocity and they, um, they sorry, they, sorry, I'm, I'm slightly getting my timeline wrong. So they shared that um, the average load time degraded to five seconds. They kind of took their eye off the ball um, and basically users noticed and users were really unhappy and the feedback that they got, they got a surprising amount of people writing them. And so you can kind of tell, if people are actually writing to you about the performance of your site. For every person that's writing you, there are like thousands of people who aren't writing you. They're just like, I'm not coming back and they're just walking away. So the people writing them saying, I will not come back to this site again. It's just too slow. And so they refocused on performance and as a result of that, they saw an increase in the conversion rate again. And these are kind of the areas of, that they highlighted when they talked about and, and very, very candidly talked about what happened. Um, so they, they basically stopped measuring, doing any kind of ongoing front-end measurement. Um, they were just kind of developing new features, as we all do. These are, and these are all very relatable problems. They had some third parties that were really poorly implemented. Um, they were waited too long to tackle performance problems. They kind of like waited for the problems to crop up rather than the kind of taking a ground up approach to making kind of like putting performance first as a feature. And kind of just relying on performance sprints to kind of like, oh, okay, let's just kind of patch up these holes and hopefully things will, will get better. And so now kind of what I want to get into these, these, these seven effective habits. So the first one is realizing, speaking of sprints, that performance isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. And it's kind of a cheesy metaphor, so I got some cheesy photos to go with it. Um, so this is, these are people sprinting. So sprinting, like we're attracted to sprints. As human beings, we love sprints because there's like, oh, I can see the end from here, so that's really appealing. Um, you know, I mean, I wear a funny costume, I don't know. And you, kind of, you can kind of celebrate it, and you're not, you're not, you're not taxed at the end. A sprint looks, this is, this is what like, sprinting is like, yes. I did it. I'm victorious. Whereas a marathon is kind of more like this. Um, and just <laughs> to put it in perspective, these are both people who won their events. So it's like <laughs> <laughs> so marathoning is 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 challenging. Um, uh, maybe a little show. I just had a curiosity. So I used to be like a pretty hardcore runner, distance running, marathon. Has anyone ever actually trained for a marathon? 
Okay, so a few people. Um, so it's, it's work. To marathon, to, to actually like train for a marathon so you actually can complete the event requires you, you have to have a plan. You have to have really clear goals. You have to, and you, you can't like kind of think, oh, okay, I'm gonna get there like in two weeks. Like, no, 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 okay, like, this week I'm gonna run 10 miles on my long run. Next week I'm gonna run 13 miles on my long run. And you kind of have to have like a really well-formulated plan. Um, you have to track yourself if you care, you know, the rigorous tracking. And the nice thing about Action Marathon is you get really, you can have really fun, cool, uh, cool tools that you can download on your phone and you can get like really persnickety about um, all the logging that you do. And that's really great if you're just a super type A person. Um, the other great thing about marathoning is that there's a lot of community spirit that goes into it. You can train with groups, you kind of run as part of a big pack, you kind of find your tribe in terms of, you know, kind of your pace, and there's a lot of community spirit that can happen in marathoning. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of celebrating milestones. You know, you're just happy when you, it's like that first day you do your 13 mile long training run, or, you know, at the end of the, the actual marathon, whenever you're, you, you run the event, it's a big celebration. And so in some ways, and I'm gonna kind of abandon this metaphor because it's gonna start falling apart really quickly, but um, the uh, marathon training in a lot of ways is kind of has, has some correlations to performance. Before I get into that though, I want to kind of talk about some of the other practices you have to have in place. So one of the traits that I've observed when I talk to companies about performance is they have a champion higher up in the organization. So Maybe that's you, or maybe that's you to start. Maybe you're the champion, but at some point, you're going to want to enlist somebody who is more senior in the org, who's maybe not involved in performance from a day-to-day -day basis, um, but somebody who understands that there, the, there's, there's value in investing in this, and they're that person who's going to kind of have your back to help you kind of drive, like, you know, getting other higher-ups to invest in your teams, to give you the time and space that you need to work on what you need to work on, and that sort of thing. So having that champion is really important. And then you need to build a cross-disciplinary team. So what I mean by that is having people who aren't just performance engineers. I mean, obviously, if you've got a tribe of great performance engineers in your organization, that's amazing, and you're lucky, and you should just go home and be thankful every day. But you need, you need more than that. You need to have people from other parts of the organization, other teams, whether it's you know, kind of e-commerce teams, or your ad team, or your third-party team, um, your, your data science team. Um, because awesome tools are not enough. And I, I say that as somebody who works with like the most awesome tools in the world, in my opinion. Um, I've seen people use even the awesome tools like ours and fail because they did not have the right teams in place and the right processes in place to use those tools really well. And so I'm gonna drop some, uh, I'm gonna, so this is another, yeah, I, I'm not quite done with the marathon thing yet. Sorry, I lied earlier. Um, so I'm gonna just kind of drop a couple of bombs on you that might blow your mind, so I'm glad you're already sitting. So two things, one, Executives in your company aren't morons. They're actually intelligent people that you can enlist to um, care about performance. They're not against you. Um, and also, um, your marketing team isn't evil, probably. I mean, maybe they are. Maybe you have this outlier kind of organization where they're like literally wearing horns and have pitchforks, but they're not. Um, Simply put, everybody in your organization probably will care about performance if you teach them how to care about performance and if you make it relevant to them. What you need to realize is that people, um, everyone who touches a page should care about the performance of the page, I, in my opinion. Um, you shouldn't have people adding single lines of JavaScript or images or content or anything to the site if they don't understand how it affects the performance of your, of your site. Um, and is this visible? Okay, cool. It's very bright down here, so I'm like, when I turn around and look back up, I just wanna make sure that you can actually um, read, read what's up there. So a few things. Um, so these are some, some strategies that um, I think are really interesting ones. So one, I've kind of touched on this, is embracing performance from the ground up. So realizing performance is a feature, um, nothing, goes into the, no, nothing goes onto the page if it um, hasn't kind of met whatever your perf performance criteria are. 
Um, a, real, a strategy that I really like is just the idea of embedded engineers. So if you have these disparate teams for your organization and you're fortunate enough to have uh, performance engineers, developers, people who really care and are knowledgeable about performance, assign those people to work with those teams. So, Another thing that you can do, and this is a strategy that I'm going to talk a little bit more about later because it comes up in, um, I think what I don't think that Tim has mentioned yet that he does a podcast called Chasing Waterfalls that he launched um, not that long ago, and he's already got, I think, two episodes, two episodes that I've listened to anyways up. And one of the, the techniques that um, came up in one of them was just this idea of enlisting performance ambassadors. So it's kind of the reverse idea of embedding engineers in teams. You can um, pull people from teams. So if you've, got, if you've got this core group of people, you can kind of get them out there and, 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 and put them in teams. But conversely, you can just kind of go around and cherry pick people from different teams in your org and say, you know, who, is, who cares enough to be the performance ambassador from that team? And then kind of once you've had this kind of team of performance ambassadors, um, then you can work together to kind of consolidate kind of what your standards are, what your practices are throughout the, throughout the org. And a really important thing is just teaching people how to use, or at the very least kind of understand and decipher the charts in the different tools that you use. So the thing that I see happening, and it's kind of kiss of death, is um, realizing that in some organizations, people have inadvertently, because I don't think anybody does this intentionally, um, they've made themselves a gatekeeper. So they're the person who they own the tools, they own the charts, they own the reporting. They're that one person that everything goes through. And it's really easy to have that happen because you feel, you know, if you are that person, this is not a criticism or a judgment, um, that, that everybody else is too busy, nobody has time for this, you're, or you're the only person who really cares, you're the only champion for this. So um, you don't want to burden other people with this responsibility. But the problem with being a gatekeeper is that as soon as you become a gatekeeper, what happens is um, if, you, if you get called into other tasks, performance drops off the radar. If you get uh, promoted, performance kind of disappears in the org. If you leave the company, if you go on vacation, performance suffers. So it's really, really important to make sure that you're kind of distributing the responsibility for performance. So one way that you can do that um, is to define your goals as an organization. What are your performance goals? What do you care about? And um, so this is um, from one of the Chasing Waterfalls uh, podcast episodes um, with Reefa Thrajali. And she um, commented that they first went to the engineering leaders and then they went to the product leaders. And when, she, when her team talked to uh, different people, their pitch in talking about performance was completely different. Talking to product leaders, the focus was on business metrics, business numbers, how performance is going to drive the business. But talking to engineering leaders, at least at PayPal, um, it was more about how are we making consumers happier? How are we driving consumer delight? Um, so I think that it's really important to understand that how you care about performance isn't going to be how somebody else cares about performance. So you need to find out what people care about. And this, you know, it takes a bit of work, but it's very doable. Um, the one amazing thing about all the different performance measurement tools that exist out there in the world is that we can now track so much stuff, like maybe too much stuff, but definitely a lot of things. And um, the great thing about, like, and this is just a handful of metrics, but you know, if somebody is a, a money person in your organization, they're on the business side of things, they might care about how you rank up against your competitors, or they might care about um, revenue or conversion rate. If somebody is kind of in the SEO team, they might care about, well, SEO. Or if they're in marketing, um, they care about maybe page views or time on site or things like that. So the really awesome thing is that all of these metrics can be correlated to performance metrics. You can take any of the performance metrics that you're accustomed to looking at, sometimes it, whether it's start render or first contentful paint or what have you, and you can correlate that with these, with these happiness and business metrics. And that's what you can use to motivate the people in your company. So for example, if people care about business metrics, 
This is a, a competitive benchmarking chart where you can see a number of media sites and you can see the basic lines represent the different start render times for all these different properties. And so this is gonna be a really motivating thing for, um, for your, you know, probably somebody senior in your organization if, who just wants to make sure that you're faster than all your competitors. You kind of show them the stack rank chart. You can actually show this kind of um, visualization even more compelling ways like a uh, side-by-side sort of film strip view, which is um, really one of the awesome features in web page test um, that kind of you can generate film strips and you can see, oh, okay, well, you know, we're really fast or we really suck. Um, our competitors is, uh, are, are much faster. Um, you can even generate side-by-side -side videos. So again, another great web page test feature um, where you can actually watch all of the, your, your, your property alongside your competitor's properties rendering side-by-side. -side. So the tools exist. You just, and, what, and one thing I have to say about this feature, it's been around for, like, for years. Um, it's probably the single most motivating thing if you're kind of early on trying to get people in your organization excited about performance. This is, gonna, this is something that usually gets people to kind of um, perk up and listen. Um, this is a correlation chart. So again, for people who can care about, care, care about business metrics, you can look at your RUM data and um, I don't know if you can make this out. The histogram is page load distribution. So you can see the kind of like, you know, most of the traffic kind of load time is somewhere between like one second and three seconds. And then there's kind of a long tail there. And then interestingly, you can see that conversions kind of like are highest for the kind of faster cohort of pages, and then they kind of like drop down and they kind of follow that long tail as they it kind of gets worse and worse. So this can be a really compelling graphic as well. If they care about user engagement. So you can do the same thing and show people load time versus bounce rate. So you can see again, similar thing, kind of the cohort of, of uh, load, uh, sorry, the histogram of load time distribution, and then as pages get slower, bounce rate increases. Um, for people who care about third parties, um, some really interesting stuff that's kind of come up on the radar uh, for a lot of people is just this idea that we can track various CPU metrics and that CPU metrics actually have a lot to teach us about how third parties on our page are behaving and are they or aren't they hurting user experience. And so you can look at metrics like first CPU idle, which um, lets you know when the CPU kind of is idle for a specific period of time, um, or first input delay, which is how long it takes the page to respond to any kind of user actual, uh, actual user input to the page. Um, and you can even uh, track things like we have this, uh, this happiness score that we do now at Speed Curve where we actually take 10 metrics, um, start render, first contentful pane, a whole bunch of other things, and bounce rate. And we divide up your traffic into you know, what's the cohort of happy users versus kind of okay users versus unhappy users. And to be a happy user, you have to actually have to, your users have to have a met all, the, all you know, the different thresholds for these 10 performance metrics that we're tracking on. Or if they care about SEO, you can, you know, Lighthouse is really awesome. You can track your SEO scores and you can, you know, kind of look at the audits and see where, you know, where kind of where you're going wrong SEO wise. If they care about third parties, we've kind of talked about this before, you can track third parties. You can actually keep an eye on how they're performing. And this is kind of going back to talking about CPU metrics. Um, just keep an, keep an eye on just the, those fluctuations over time. And then I really love this one. You can, now, you can kind of create correlation charts about pretty much anything. If you're capturing metrics, that are you know some type of user or, you know kind of user behavior and and uh, and a performance metric you can capture those and so this okay you can, you can see it here um, you can see that as CPU time increases um, bounce rate increases 
So that's a really interesting way of just demonstrating to people, like the CPU time is actually an a, a illustration of how all the JavaScript on your page is, is performing. And you can see that there's a relationship. This is the, and this chart isn't that stark, but um, I've seen sometimes uh, the CPU correlation charts where the bounce rate kind of just goes way up as CPU time slows down. So again, just a really good way of visualizing that to people to, so they understand that all the JavaScript on your pages actually does something to user behavior. So, okay, good, that shows up. Um, so I just kind of created this chart. By no means is this meant to be exhaustive. These are merely suggestions. I feel like I need to like, give a lot of caveats for this. Um, but it's, it, it, these are at least some good places to start from when you're investigating your own metrics. So if people, are, you know, I kind of, kind of talked about this for executives, you know, you can show them uh, competitive benchmarking or correlation charts. Marketing, you can show them third-party performance, correlation charts. Um, things like image size, even um, if they are, you know, if, if your marketing team is responsible for adding images to your pages, which they probably are. Um, and then for your devs and engineers, well, they probably act, I, they could care about a lot of things. So I didn't even want to attempt to put that here. You, this is where you're kind of going to need to go deeper and actually kind of engage with your teams and talk about and, and, and kind of analyze the metrics that you're looking at and make sure that you're looking at the right ones. I did a whole talk about that actually last year, right here on this stage, so you can go find that if you are really interested. And then the next step is just making people accountable. And accountability is sort of, it's, it's funny, it sort of sounds like a little bit judgy, like you're accountable now. Um, but to me, I, like, I love being accountable. It means that I actually have control over something. And you know, in this otherwise meaningless, chaotic, random universe, I'd like to be accountable for a few things. It makes me feel like I have like a center of gravity in my life. Um, so performance budgets are a good way to make people accountable. Um, so if you're, if, how many people here actually um, are currently using performance budgets on their pages? Okay, so a fair few, which is great. Um, so what a performance budget is, and there's a lot of different ways you can implement these. Adi Asmani wrote a really great, very long post um, that, you can, that I really recommend that you read um, to learn more about them. And like I said, I, I did a talk about this last year um, at Perf Now. Um, but really, they're just various metrics. It could be milestone timings or quantity-based timings like image weight or rules-based timing like your Lighthouse scores or your user happiness score. And you just... Um, you assign, oh, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be less mean in a second, if anybody wants, still getting a shot of that. Um, and so you've uh, determined what metrics matter for your site, and ideally, you know, like looking at things like correlation charts will help you kind of pare that down. And then um, you assign a value to that. And again, going back to looking at a correlation chart, um, you can kind of see like, oh, okay, well things plateau for us when we hit kind of four seconds. So four seconds is our threshold. So uh, a good performance budget should show you what your budget is, when you go out of bounds, how long you're out of bounds, and then hopefully you get back on track and it'll show you that as well. So this is an example of um, some performance budget charts from Zillow. Um, they wrote a really great blog post, and the link is um, here at the bottom of the slide. Um, it's a few years old, and it's kind of one of the early case studies that I remember reading about, about a, a company actually putting performance budgets into practice. And so they did a really great job of explaining how perf having performance budgets really helped them. And so this chart and the ones that I'm going to show you on the next slide just were used to illustrate kind of how they, uh, having performance budgets really helped them to triangulate on a problem. So the first thing they noticed was that suddenly they were out of bounds on their entire load time budget. So bad, but that could mean anything. So they looked at their other budgets and they saw that, okay, really quickly, okay, the other areas where they're out of bounds were the number of image requests and total image size. And so they realized that something had kind of gone rogue. And if you read the blog post, you can see they, they quickly kind of triangulated on the fact that it was just a few rogue images that had been added and they were able to quickly fix the problem and, and things back to normal. So just a really simple example, but just how knowing what you need to track and then just, just tracking on it can kind of help you fix problems really, really quickly. 
So just again, these are just suggestions for some metrics that you could look at for performance budgets, you know, for your ops folks who wanna track backend issues, time to first bite, that's a good one. Um, for marketing folks, you can look at things like your, how much, how, your hero rendering times, how long it takes for hero elements on your page to render, or largest contentful paint, um, which is a new metric that I really like that just looks at the, um, in the viewport, what is the largest visual element, so whether it's an image or a video. Um, or your Lighthouse SEO score, or for devs and engineers, you know, you might want to look at start render, or speed index, or your Lighthouse performance score. Others as well, but these are, again, like I said earlier, kind of a good jumping off point. And you need to give people ownership. And this is so, so, so important. You can get all the way up to this point, and if you don't hit this, um, then you can still go off the rails and find yourself really frustrated. So this is a, a, another podcast um, that I recommend checking out. It's Vox Media being interviewed on the Responsive Web pod, uh, Design Podcast. And um, I can't remember who it was. It was maybe Tim and, um, Tim and Henri talking about performance cops just earlier. So um, Laura Hogan kind of coined this term like performance janitors, performance cops. You don't want to be a performance cop. Um, you don't want to set yourself up as that person or a group of people who are going around, as Dan says, slapping people on the wrist saying, you built an article that broke the page size budget, take that down. Um, so their goal, when they set up themselves as a, as, as a performance team, was to kind of consider themselves to be more like an in-house performance consultancy, to um, provide best practices, guides, guidance, to be kind of just a known resource within the company. And um, you're gonna have much greater success long-term if you have people knowing that you're there as a resource, but ultimately um, understanding performance budgets and setting their own targets based on what they know. Because um, you know, I think anybody who's been doing performance for a long time will tell you they, none of us are, know everything. So people you know, in other teams, it could be your marketing team, your executives, they might actually know something that you know that actually helps to define a better me uh, metric and a better number than what you would necessarily assign them. And you need to communicate. So um, again, another great podcast episode on Chasing Waterfalls, Malika Kim um, from Priceline, saying, it basically said that we as engineers should learn how to show the impact on anything that we do. And that's really, really important. Like, you know, these aren't like kind of treasured secrets. Um, and you need to make sure that you're communicating that in a way that's meaningful for the audience. It's basically the right place, at the right time, in the right format. Otherwise, you kind of end up in this situation where nobody's actually getting the message. So what that could look like. So maybe if, if you have performance budget set up, you can uh, get alerted. And you know, we have, I, I see people using Slack, and they have an entire Slack channel that's just set up for tracking performance budget alerts and, um, and then kind of mitigating those. You could have a wall monitor where you actually just have some key charts and you're refreshing those charts on a daily basis and it's kind of up in an, uh, an area of the office that's high traffic and people can see that and maybe it's, um, charts that you care about could be your competitive benchmarking. Um, it could, which could go well or badly, I guess, depending on how much you want to motivate, how, how you like to motivate people. Um, uh, so just really, kind of really whatever you want to use to motivate people. And I see a lot of a lot more companies using wall monitors as a way to kind of keep performance top of mind. Um, maybe you just kind of have all of your performance budgets just in a dashboard, and you just kind of. Yeah, that you check out periodically and you just see like when something's in the red and you can kind of uh, drill down and fix the problem there. Maybe you get reports. So this is kind of just a screenshot of part of a, a weekly report that gets sent out where you just really simple measurements that show you this is where we are this week, this is where we were last week, did we get better or worse? And that's just something that gets automatically sent out maybe on a weekly basis. Um, <laughs> Is Andre here? Does he see this slide of himself? I just kind of grabbed this. Maybe you do in-house meetups. This is from the Toronto Web Performance Meetup. But maybe you do in-house meetups, or you do lunch and learns, or you do hackathons um, like uh, like PayPal. You know the the podcast episode that Tim did um, with Refath, where they did just the way that they started to drive performance culture in PayPal was actually just to to start with a hackathon and then take the results of that hackathon and kind of show it around the the organization and uh, and and get people excited. 
So actually having face-to-face -face contact with people is, is a really good thing. And then kind of making sure the message is getting out. I talked earlier about kind of the right time, right place. Um, so, you know, 24-7 wall monitors and dashboards, real time, you know, for alerting reports. I don't know about you, I, like I get a million emails a day, like not actually a million, but like a lot. And I do this and don't even read a lot of them because they're just things that I'm BCC'd on or whatever. So you want to make sure that you're not inundating people with stuff. So kind of having a really tight, meaningful weekly report, um, no more than once a week, I would, I would hope. Um, and then meetups, hack hackathons, making that part of your culture. So maybe you do that on a regular basis, like at least once a month. And then celebrate. This is really important. And I think that as, you know, kind of Western world and this kind of culture that we live in, it's really, I think, as, and this isn't just, it doesn't just apply to tech and performance. I think it's just in life in general, we don't celebrate things enough. And I think that we need to kind of slow down, take pause, and celebrate all of our wins, big and small. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. So you just ring that bell. Just kind of say, look, I did a thing, and it was a good thing. Pay attention, everyone. Um, uh, Lara, kind of, I think, you know, a lot of people are familiar with kind of this donut idea that um, every time Lara w uh, Hogan, uh, when she was at Etsy, would have, a, have some kind of win, she would celebrate by getting a donut, and then sort of donuts just became a bit synonymous with performance wins for a lot of us. Um, you can celebrate the performance heroes in your company. So this is uh, Etsy. They would basically find somebody in the organization who wasn't necessarily a performance engineer. It was just somebody, like, say, in marketing who were like, like, realize like, oh, you know what? I've realized this image is actually really big and so I made it smaller and they, 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 they fixed something and sort of just to celebrate that in the company. So having like regular performance heroes. Oh, and just, or just having a tweet. Just a really great tweet. Like, look at this, this is from um, the Telegraph UK. And um, Gareth tweeted this, just basically that they, you know, improve TTI by 50% by making a few changes. And it got, you said that's like 104 likes from one tweet. And it's just, it's just really nice. Like, I love seeing things like this show up in my feed. And I will always retweet. Um, or you can write a blog post. You know, something was really successful. You have something to share. You can maybe, you know, the Telegraph has a really great, actually, a, a tech blog on Medium that you, I encourage you to check out. But a lot of companies have great tech blogs. Um, and again, one of the things I love about this community is just the sharing that happens. Score some easy wins. So as a shout out for Andy wherever he is, right over there, Andy. Um, basically, for some of you, maybe you're kind of past this, but for a lot of companies, I think there's, there's still the dull, boring stuff that you can tackle, like dealing with third-party scripts, dealing with images, extraneous code, deferring assets, all of these things that you can score some really quick wins and get people excited very early on and kind of become a bit of a hero, especially for the new person in the org or the person who's just starting to champion a new initiative. Um, so, for example, Priceline shared how they all they did was they shaved 15 kilobytes off their logo, which doesn't sound like much. Um, they ran A-B tests with the new old logo side by side. I love A-B tests. And they found that they actually increased bookings by a pretty significant amount. And so that was just one little win um, with uh, doing something that, you know, by all accounts would seem pretty basic. And yet it, it was actually pretty substantial. So just to summarize... Um, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Get champions, build teams, set goals, make people, including yourself, accountable, communicate, celebrate. And just bear in mind, like, there's no magic. Like, we hear about companies, you know, I, when I first started, got involved in performance, I would hear about companies like Etsy, for example, where it just seemed like, wow, they have such an amazing performance culture, and they're so fast, and they're so on it. And I think a lot of people felt it's easy to feel kind of intimidated by that and kind of feel like, well, I can't achieve that. But really, um, uh, Katie Seiler Miller from Etsy, who, who spoke at Perfnell last year, she shared, and I, I was really impressed with her candor, she shared how, you know, the Etsy's management changed, their structure changed, teams changed, some key people left who had been driving performance, and performance started to go off the rails for them. And they realized they needed to get back on track. And so it's really, you know, no magic. There's no secret sauce. It's just having a plan, doing the work, and then being patient and realizing you need to actually, it can take months sometimes to kind of just build culture, drive excitement in your, in your organization. So thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to speak to you today.
it was, that was great, Tammy. Thank you. Um, I liked how you kept uh, you get some very precise, actionable, like do this or like the timings on like alerts and stuff like that. It was great. Um, so you mentioned you touched a little bit on uh, the organizational aspect of like performance engineers that are distributed or having performance ambassadors or the performance team. Um, could you talk a little bit about the performance team aspect of like, do you think that should companies be aspiring to have a dedicated performance team? And if so, like what is the role? Or do you think it's more efficient or effective to handle that structure in a different way? I guess basically like, let's say that they're starting right now and they want to make, get to this point. Do they build out a dedicated team? Do they start with the small groups? I think, I mean, I think that when I use, when I think about the idea of a performance team, I think about it in really loose terms. Like, so, I mean, I think that the, 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 the the way that we kind of naturally gravitate towards thinking about it is a bunch of people kind of all working in a shared space and they talk to each other daily and they're just kind of like a pod. But I kind of, like when I actually think about what feels more effective, especially in larger orgs, I actually kind of think that the whole ambassador model of having like, you know, kind of people out being distributed throughout the org, but, you know, still having you know, kind of each other as kind of a touch point. I think the really important thing is whatever you call it is just have something called performance in your organization so that people know that it even exists because labels, you know, help. Yeah, this yeah. is true. Uh, yeah, we joke a little bit about job titles and stuff like that, but it, you know, titles, labels do tend to stick inside of an organization. So whether you call it like, you know, it's your performance team, performance initiative, performance ambassadors, performance something, but to just have performance club, I don't know, if you want it to be more fun. <laughs> does, that, does that go for somebody who's coming back, like maybe they go back after the conference, back to their company, and there's nothing right now. Mm -hmm. uh, does that go for them? Do they call themselves a performance club and invite people in? Like, how do you start when you're that one first person who's really excited and wants to get this going? Well, I think, I mean, the, the nice thing about coming to a conference like this is that can actually be kind of your, your, your stepping stone to doing that because, you know, ideally you've learned a lot, you've got some good takeaways, and you can kind of do like maybe a lunch and learn where it's like, this is what I learned at Perf Now. And, you know, there's some real, some, these are some of the takeaways and um, kind of distill it down to do like next steps. These are the three things that I think we as an organization need to tackle next and kind of use that as the jumping off point for, for what you do next. So yeah. Um, you mentioned a lot of like visual ways of communicating performance, which I'm a huge fan of, like the, the like doing the water. Um, I'm sorry, the uh, the screenshots or the mm -hmm. film strips or the dashboards. Um, you know, one of the things I think that somebody posed was, you know, sometimes that that's great for things like start render or paint things and you know visual metrics. Mm -hmm. But we're also getting to a point where a lot of the metrics that we're running into, some of the stuff you showed, like JavaScript CPU time or first input delay or long tasks have a huge impact on that experience, but they're not able, it's not a very easy thing to show visually. So like you could look at a film strip and it looks great. Uh, meanwhile, third parties or frameworks are destroying the main thread of the CPU. So how do you, have you seen any creative ways of trying to make that more apparent to people inside the organization who maybe don't have the technical foundation to just get it? So, just if I understand, like you're kind of asking how to help people understand maybe a little more abstract metrics like CPU metrics and things yeah, like that. Yeah, how do you, how do you, is there a way to do for like those metrics, like mm -hmm. make it apparent to the non-technical folks without making them like read a waterfall or look at a browser thread, <laughs> yeah. kind of a CPU flame chart or something like that. Like how do we communicate that in a visual way? Well, I think the correlation charts are kind of a step in that direction. So if you can like, you know, CPU time, like I've looked at a lot of correlation charts that look at CPU time versus bounce rate, and there's a pretty strong correlation in almost all of them. Like sometimes it's steeper than others. Sometimes, depending on the site, it can be more flat. But um, so that's, I think that's a really good one to start with because, you know, yeah, maybe people don't, you don't want to spend a long time kind of talking about like you know, what the various CPU metrics mean. But if you just say like shorthand, CPU time, JavaScript, bad, you know, CPU time, good, bounce rate, good, you know, and kind sure. of just Tarzan it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, so Tarzan it up is, uh, is something I wasn't expecting to hear so much during the conference. <laughs> Um, all right, well, thank you very much, Tammy. That was Thanks. fantastic. Again, Tammy. Thanks.